There, there is a commitment to be done by 10 o'clock. Patrick! Oh, yeah. How you doing, big guy? I'm assuming, I'm assuming that the size of the crowd has a lot to do with our guests. It doesn't have to do with it being a rainy day and nobody has anything else to do. Uh, not from this crowd. This is, this, is, this is made up of some of the most dedicated and uh, hardest working people I've, I ever associate myself with. And I, it's an honor, to be quite honestly, from from all that you do. Um, based off of the size of the crowd, and we do have some new faces, that I think that the best thing we can do is take like five to six minutes, we'll quickly go around just with a little bit of introduction. Um, you, you, we got the name tags, but there might be some people who need to connect with other people. That's what we find in a lot of these meetings, is that uh, you put faces with some names, but you you have an ability to connect and do a little networking afterwards. So uh, jot it down if that's the person. You know where they're sitting, where they, where they happen to be. So uh, I am uh, Peter Muse, President and CEO of First Citizens Federal Credit Union, and honored to be co-chair of this group with uh, my uh, partner to the left. Good morning. I'm Senator Michael Rodericks. Honored to be co-chair with Peter. And this is a wonderful crowd. Thank you all for being here this morning. I'm Aaron Gornstein from the Department of Housing and Community Development. I'm Liz Rogers with the Interagency Council on Housing and Homelessness. So you, you can hear from the organizations that there is an incredible geographic representation here, which is what we do. Um, and, and I think that from a, an organizational point of view, the ability of everybody to be able to work together whenever, whenever there is a need um, and hopefully carry over some best practices and, and I know since we started the organization, that there is a there is something that somebody uh, mentions that, that, that piques the curiosity, maybe from Attleboro to Fall River, or Fall River to Bedford, and Bedford to Taunton, and over to Wadeham, of, uh, of, of things that they'd like to try to do in their organizations for to improve. So it's been absolutely, absolutely wonderful. So thank you all for attending, and Janet, as usual, thank you very much for. You're not, I know you're not hosting, but, but, you're, but you're kind of the hostess wherever you happen to be. Right? So, uh, uh, again, I thank you so very much. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have Under Secretary uh, Aaron Goldstein with us, and I know he's first on the agenda, but I always turn to my partner and, and give you an opportunity for uh, uh, any kind of an update as what you would need. Uh, well, I'm very, um, I'm looking forward to listening to Secretary Goldstein. Um, uh, and, um, Hear what he has to say. I think that, um, as you see from the representation that's here, that we've been very active here in the South Coast in trying to do everything we can to deal with the issue of homelessness uh, from a uh, from a multiple uh, variety of ways. And I'm just going to turn right over to okay. the secretary okay. and, uh, and listen very intently. Sure. Well, yes. let me first thank the senator for his support in the legislature for all the things you're working on. PATD is focusing on in terms of affordable housing policies. Thank you so much for, for that and to uh, uh, Peter for your leadership here. This is one of our most active regional networks, so I know that um, you've been actively engaged for several years. And it, it makes a huge difference to us to have such coordination going on in, in this region. And, uh, I know it makes a big difference to people like Paulette and other people in the field who work for DHCD to just, and, and for me to be able to hear your feedback. So I want, I'm here to really thank you for, for your great work, update you um, on kind of where things are in terms of policy and program implementation, and then hear from you if we have time. I'd love to um, hear what's on your minds and questions you have. Um, and then Liz Rogers is here with me who is the um, Executive Director of the Interagency Council on Housing and Homelessness. I'm sure most of you know Liz quite well. Um, who's been doing a great job in bringing in all of our state agency partners around the homeless issues, which I know is, um, is a key part of the, of the overall strategy. So I have a handout. I'm not going to go through all these bullets, because you could take them back and look at it and then certainly email me anytime and ask me questions uh, about it, but just to try and get the highlights. Before we go into the current fiscal year, which is FY15, let me back up for a second. On last fiscal year, FY14, we were able to issue a 1,000 new um, MRVP vouchers. That's the State Rental Assistance Program, as you know, which the legislature has revived and increased funding from two fiscal years ago from $35 million up to $65 million. Again, thank you, Senator, for your support of 
that program. It's been a really important program for low-income households. So that's the mobile vouchers, and then we have what we call project-based MRVPs, which help for the development of new affordable housing for extremely low-income households and formerly homeless households. And we issued uh, 300 MRVPs as well as 200 Section 8 project-based vouchers. That's the most number of new project-based vouchers in any one year in, in decades. So we're, um, we're very focused on that. We're, we helped 2,000 families, or you helped some of those 2,000 families to exit shelter with home base household assistance, and I'll talk more about that. We, the RAF program, again, another program that has been ramped up over the past two fiscal years. Um, we're now at our highest funding level ever under that program in FY15, but we were able to help close to 3,000 families under the RAF program to prevent them from becoming homeless. This is the short-term financial assistance that's provided in this region uh, through South Shore Housing, and I know that you work with a lot of um, other organizations on it, Carl. And then uh, we're trying to build more permanent affordable housing with support services, with wraparound services, and the governor had set a goal of doing 1,000 units over three years, which was back in early 2013. And we met the goal uh, almost two years early. So we, we created 1,000 units last year of permanent supportive housing, again, with funding from the legislature and targeted um, service dollars and also emergency assistance. So that's been great. We greatly expanded the Secure Jobs Program, which I know that you run here in this region, in the jobs, and um, we were able to expand that program by 1.5 million in partnership with the Fireman Foundation. <coughs> and then, in addition to the supportive housing, we have our other kinds of affordable housing that we're doing, and uh, we were able to fund 3,000 units of affordable housing um, as well. And since uh, 2007, we were able to hit our mark of 20,000 affordable units. So we're, we're doing quite a bit. We're using all of our capital resources at the state and federal level to build and preserve um, existing affordable housing as well. So that's the highlights of uh, last fiscal year. And um, thank you for your role and your help in accomplishing all those. There's many more things I could mention, but those are some of the highlights. So MRVP, again, the Rental Assistance Program, We've issued 2,000 new vouchers and 730 project-based vouchers in just in, since we started growing the program again. And right now, we're in the process of issuing just over 1,000 more new mobile vouchers under that program and 350 new project-based vouchers. So again, very active. This is a breakdown on how um, the legislature gave us an increase, and this is a breakdown on how we're planning to spend that increase. We're doing this through the local housing authorities and the regional administering agencies, such as South Shore Housing, but also through the local housing authorities. And that's the first time in many years that the housing authorities are now active in, reissue, in, in serving individuals and families off their waiting lists, which they haven't really been able to do for a long time. There's the Secure Jobs program I mentioned, and there's legislative language that um, sets aside some MRP, MRP, MRVP vouchers specifically for participants in the program. So we're setting aside 75 vouchers. These are um, families who have participated at least three months, and we're doing it by region, so we're going to be issuing those shortly. Um, I don't know, Liz, if people here have been notified exactly how many vouchers yet. Um, we just recently sent out information about that, I think last week, to give an indication of sort of how the percentage would be broken down based on um, your total enrollment. So, uh, our people who are eligible. Um, so, uh, we've been in touch, I believe, through Maria um, regarding how to, we'll to accept the list of the secure jobs, uh, secure jobs um, agencies, and then we'll have a lottery that will post later this month and then issue the vouchers in early November. So we don't know yet how many the we're Up getting the store. Not yet. We need to collect all of the, gotcha. the lists first, and then we'll be able to tell. But it'll be broken down um, by each um, secure jobs agency, um, their relative to their percentage of total eligible participants. So it'll probably so. be in the neighborhood of ten to twelve to twenty or probably something. right around yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, moving on to home base, which is the next area. Um, you know we've been working very closely with the families who have been timing out of the rental, short-term rental assistance program under home base um, very, very intensively. And that started, there were about 5,400 families that were timing out in fiscal year 14. And that we had really, um, really got through all that through a lot of hard work at the local level, including uh, fantastic work in this region. So at the time that people were ending their assistance, it's been a I'm just giving you the overall data of 9% return um, into shelter. Our goal was 20%. Uh, so when you look at the national data on return rates, 9% um, is very good. And then if you do it on a cumulative basis and you really go back, some families that might have timed out several months ago, we're still tracking. And the overall cumulative rate is 13%. So that gives you an idea. We're still well below what our target goal was. And so it couldn't have been um, done without all the, all the great work and support services that were provided to these families. Um, now, it does mean some have had to come back into shelter. Of those who've come back in, about a third have already um, been placed out of shelter. So that was a, a big agenda item for, for um, the past fiscal year. So I wanted to give you an update on that. Now, we went up to providing $8,000 per family so that they, to help them um, transition out of emergency shelter and the hotels and motels. And that's really helped. In, we, we've been seeing more exits as a result of going up what was 4000 at one point, now up to $8,000 per family. Not everyone gets the full 8000 but that's um, the amount we're going up to. Um, we're also focusing much more on diversions. And um, particularly in this region, we've seen very, very high um, success rates there so that um, families who were coming into shelter were, were offering them. Also, we increased the amount of your home base from 4000 to 6000 to help them, um, sort of, you know, prevent them from having to come into shelter. And then co-locating staff in our uh, Brockton office. Um, and again, uh, Father Bills and others have been working very closely through South Shore on that um, effort. So that's also paying off. Yeah, yeah, to me, I think having the provider staff in the agencies with our homeless Very coordinators make, yeah. makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, so you've got to reach the families and really work with them closely um, in terms of the financial assistance. Um, under the RAF program, we were able to start up the program on July 1st, on July 1st this fiscal year. We ran out of funds and had been running out of funds in May um, each fiscal year. Um, and so we started it up right away, even I think before the budget was signed. And as a result, we've been able to help about 500 families in the first two months. When you look at, compared to last year, it's 154. So it's great that we're able to get that, that started right away. Um, I just The next slide is, is to give you a sense of the entries and exits out of shelter. And it compares this summer to last summer. And the summer months tend to be, as you know here, our highest entries into emergency shelter. Some people, it's counterintuitive for some. Some people think it's the winter time, but it actually isn't. It's, it's the summertime in between the school year, you know, the end of school and the start of school. That's when the families are more transitory and we see higher entries. And that's just historic uh, of the shelter <laughs> system. So we had very high, en high entries last summer, and that's why the numbers went up in the hotels and motels. And the entries are still high, but they came down somewhat. But you can see we're doing better on diversion, better on exits. Um, and the motel numbers, whereas last summer went up by 557 across the state in the motels, went down a bit um, this summer. And so we consider that really great progress, um, considering the factors we're still dealing with. And we do see a heavy demand for emergency shelter in the, on the family side. Um, it continues, as, as I'm sure you're, you're quite aware. And that makes it very challenging each day to place families. And we're obligated to place families who qualify that same day. And we have to look for vacant shelter beds. So sometimes when the shelters are full, we then have to go to the hotels and motels. And even there, it's becoming harder and harder to place families within the, their area. And um, so you see more families 
um, having to be placed out of area, which is very unfortunate. It's certainly not our preference. Um, and we're trying to move the families back as quickly as possible. But we are obligated to place on that same day and find an opening. Um, <coughs> so that's what we've been doing. Um, we have a program called the New Lease Program, which is working with private owners and subsidized housing to offer units for families coming out of shelter. And we've been able to place 63 families through that new program. And then we're starting more case management into the hotels and motels now. Um, we find that we need almost a 24-hour presence in some on weekend times um, to work with the families intensively. We're, our staff are going out there, and as well as the state, other state agency staff, on a very regular basis. I mean, I know that many volunteer groups are also helping in the hotels and motels, and we thank you for that. But we're trying to actually um, ramp that up even more um, and, and work more closely with the families. Um, we did hire an assistant director of hotel and motel field operations. Um, I don't know if you've met um, her, oh, if she, if she, I'm she sure she's been down to Felicia. Well, we can set that up. <laughs> and so you should know that Felicia is available. Um, obviously, you can talk to Paulette as well, but she is responsible specifically now for the hotels and motels and the families there. So that's been good. And we have staffed up our field offices, our compliance unit, our placement unit, um, and when I got to DHCD, I found that there just wasn't the capacity to handle appeals, to handle placements of the non-compliances that we're facing. And I think we're now in a much, much better situation staffing-wise at DHCD and in the field offices. Um, it doesn't mean we're all the way there. Um, I'd still actually like to see more positions um, in the field, um, given the number of applications that we get every day. But I think we've made really good progress, both on the um, having more hearing officers in terms of appeals, um, focusing on the non-compliances and processing those more quickly, and um, while at the same time providing due process for every family in terms of their appeal. So I wanted you to know that that's been a, a very big focus over the past two years um, for me and for the other senior staff. And then we're um, continuing to expand in terms of new congregate shelter as an alternative to having to place families in hotels and motels. And we are continuing to bring on more beds. Um, and um, I think it's just the best thing to do right now, given the demand. These are programs with 24-hour staffing, provide much better support services to the families so they can get back on their feet. There's, there's kitchens in, in these um, facilities. And um, they're just far, there's play space, there's access to transportation. Those are the things that are lacking in, in many of the hotels and motels. So we're continuing that as well. I'm going to turn it over to Liz on the next two uh, items and then kind of wrap up and have to take questions. So you want to go? Great, yes. Yeah. Um, so just an update on some of the key ICHH initiatives we've been working on recently. Um, I was very much hoping that I would have um, in front of you right now, the final 2014 youth count report, but I think it's going to be available tomorrow. <laughs> I've been fighting to get it today, but um, so uh, as soon as that is public, you will have it in your email inboxes. Um, but really wanted just to thank the three COCs here who really took up the charge to, to work with us on the first statewide count of unaccompanied homeless youth this past winter. We are the first state who is, who's done it. Um, I can give you a little bit of, sna of a snapshot from the results. So we had 2,510 surveys returned to us from across the state. 795 of those met the commission's definition of the unaccompanied homeless youth, which is just slightly broader than HUD's definition. Um, and about 6% uh, of those came from the three COCs here. So it was 46 total um, homeless youth from, from this area. But that, of course, is not uh, intended to, to mean that we've captured every single one. It's a snapshot. I think it's, it represents a pretty good sample. But it was the first time out of the gate. So um, fortunately, the legislature has made appropriations for us to continue the youth count this coming year. Um, I've been in touch with the COC leads uh, regarding that. We've made, um, uh, again, small capacity building grants available to each COC to support those efforts and um, 
really this fall we'll be working with, with the region, uh, really with the whole state to, to conduct the count again. Sarah has been um, a, a member of our working group uh, overseeing this for the Unaccompanied Homeless Youth Commission. Um, and so, um, you know, we're really excited and thrilled to be able to do it again. So, uh, I know, <clears throat> having a conversation, uh, there is process and procedure that, that needed to be developed for yes, the first time uh, to, to try to count to count uh, a person who doesn't want to be counted yes. is, is not an easy task. So I'm hoping that uh, one of the results will be an opportunity to have a discussion about best practices yes. of finding individuals who don't want to be counted, or who, or who in, in some cases don't even consider themselves mm -hmm. on, a count, on that company. So, so the number has got to be considered a low number. Yes. Uh, so I don't. I, 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 my, my caution on that is that some people may may hear a number and say there isn't a problem, yes. but the number doesn't doesn't define a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, defining the problem is the process of getting to that number. And I know we spent quite a bit of time, and I think that uh, the, a discussion around the best practices of a process would be very helpful within. Uh, to, to get this thing going. Yeah, I really couldn't have said that any better, so I'm glad you oh. articulated that. Well, there we go. You're, you're there we go. Right I, I right have up. some value. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, no, you're absolutely right, and so the report, which um, you'll all hopefully be seeing tomorrow, um, ha is quite lengthy, and it goes into a lot of depth regarding process and what outreach strategies the different COCs took on, uh, what worked, what didn't work, what, you know, what uh, the COCs have identified as areas where they know they want to try to improve. Um, you know, some of the the um, sort of assumed undercount is related to um, youth who are disconnected from services. So I think some of what you're getting at, Peter, you know, a lot of the outreach was focused on working with providers in the community who um, had participants in some of their programs who were unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, and, but it was, it's much more difficult to reach youth who aren't being served by a known entity and um, maybe more um, trying to stay under the radar for one reason or another. Um, you know, DESE puts out information annually about homeless um, students in, in school and you know, those numbers are much higher than what we got in our town. So we've continued in, in our working group to try to understand how do we how do we use these two sources of data to tell a bigger picture, tell, tell a bigger story. Um, so it's a work in progress and um, our hope is that in early November we'll be bringing all of the COCs together again to talk about what they did last year, what can we do this year, what are additional outreach strategies, how do we continue to engage youth as volunteers to help us identify where should we be going, how do we how do we engage homeless youth in a more effective way. Um, so we have a, a long way to go, but I'm, I'm very, very um, excited by the fact that we had statewide participation in this initial count, and we're beginning to understand a little bit more about the, the scope of the problem and the circumstances that these youth um, are experiencing. So, um, so yes, thank you, Peter, for, <laughs> for, for providing that uh, additional caveat. The report is full of caveats. Um, you'll see that. So, um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, um, so more to come on that, but thank you again for all your commitment. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, I do have a handout that's the uh, blueprint on ending homelessness among older adults. Um, we, we put this out in May. Um, we have formed a steering committee as part of the ICH that involves the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, DPH, DMH, DHCD, I mean, you know, you can name it, and as well as some additional um, community-based partners. Um, Elliot has been participating in that as well, um, Mass Housing and Shelter Alliance. Um, and we really wanted to look at this um, issue of homelessness among older adults and try to understand a little bit better what perhaps some of their unique needs might be. Um, the blueprint you'll see is very um, simple. It's meant to be descriptive in what we know at this point about the scope of that problem in Massachusetts. and has at the end a short-term action plan, which we've taken steps to begin implementing. Um, and um, 
you know, I think at this point, we're really hoping to start talking to all of the COCs and all of the regional networks a little bit more about this. Um, you know, one of the short-term action items is related to uh, looking at existing initiatives and trying to understand how are those initiatives serving older adults? Um, are there things that we can do to enhance those existing initiatives to be more effective for older adults and to be more responsive to their particular needs? Um, you know, chronic, the, the chronic population is oftentimes over age 50, and a lot of organizations and a lot of networks have targeted initiatives related to chronic homelessness. So um, it's, it's been an effort of ours to try to sort of shift the thinking a little bit to be more aware of the fact that you know, in a lot of cases these are older, um, older people. Um, so I really just sort of put it out to you now and start thinking about you know, how, how can we um, consider older adults um, in our discussions. I know you have an individual services. Um, so we did have an elder conference summit maybe two winters ago now. Great. It might be time to do that again. Yeah. Damaris came and Mark um, Hinderley from yeah, from Park. From Park. So we're, we're looking at that, you know, we have a veterans, uh, statewide veterans plan, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and we've been looking at that plan, how can we make sure that our work related to any veterans homelessness is also being conscious of the fact that many of those veterans are over age 50, um, and uh, what additional resources might we bring to bear that can assist them. So um, just trying to broaden our thinking around this a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, we have been making progress on implementation of that statewide plan to end veteran homelessness. Another handout you have, just the one pager, is um, a, a resource guide that we put together. Um, it can be adapted for your region. You can add to it. I think Western has um, they recently put together a veterans subcommittee of their network, similar to what you have done. And one of their first orders of business was to take this resource guide and add to it to make it uh, sort of locally relevant for them. This is meant to be something very simple that you could share with the VSOs in the region, you could share with the SSVF providers, um, and, and it's meant to serve as something that could be, you know, if I have a homeless veteran or a veteran at risk in front of me, I don't know who to call first. Here's, here's sort of the first at some initial phone numbers it talks about VSO, it talks about um, you know, COC program. So um, we're hoping that you, you might find that this useful and might be able to adapt it for your own purposes here. Look, that may be just a nice opportunity for me. I know we went around the table, but uh, Michael C. Johns has joined us, and, and people might want to know why, um, because it's good. But, but more, more <laughs> almost as importantly, is, is he is now the, the president of the Massachusetts uh, VS uh, Veteran Service uh, Association. Uh, uh, so uh, his, his travels are statewide, uh, but his locality, I think, is Foxborough. But he's done a lot of, a lot of work with us. Um, we, one of the things you always try to look for is where you may be missing things. And, and I think consistently we felt that we were missing a, 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 a veterans, uh, the, we have some organizations here, some of the outreach uh, through the VSO. Uh, Mike has uh, agreed to join us uh, on this council, which is probably going to be very, very, uh, a very good networking opportunity for a lot of people in this room. Um, but we have agreed with Mike that we would, we would use him in this organization, and he could use us statewide. Uh, the organization that we have here uh, we feel very comfortable that it's, it's, it does a great job, as uh, the Secretary has mentioned, and if we can use that to help support Mike's organization, uh, we want to be able to do that as well. So that's a, you know, I know we went around the names, and you, you might see the initials there, but you might not have put it together as, as a uh, direct connection for us uh, in the veterans and the VSO, uh, which touches the cities and towns. It's really, really great. And we're really grateful for all the support you've given to these initiatives. Thank you. Peter, if I might. Um, it, it was several months back that uh, uh, Peter and Janet and I met, and uh, I was uh, excited to, to join this, this group. And it was after uh, attending the Spring Summit that uh, really piqued my interest, and I saw the great work that uh, was happening here on the South Coast. And uh, as Peter said, I wanted to take this and, and further develop it around the rest of the state. 
was fantastic. The energy, the participation, uh, the resources, and I would uh, I would love to take this electronically and send it to my 400 members yes. this afternoon. I was hoping you might uh, say that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I'll reach out to my 400 members, and so they have it at their fingertips. And there, of course, the VSOs are just working with the Council on Aging directors and the sort of thing. So uh, thank you very much. Yes. Very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Liz, can we get this electronic? Absolutely. Like I'll send all this also. stuff electronically to Jan and, and I'll push it out to industry. everybody. Thank you. Just make sure I have your email if you're not a regular member of the of the network. Yeah, there is a sign up sheet. I know we started the meeting on time with people coming in, so please and that helps Jan as well. Uh, check that off at the end of the meeting and make sure your email addresses are correct, not just not just there. Right. And make sure I can read them. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, Liz. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the one other item I just wanted to mention about that was that we have met our goal of 250 units but, um, of new veterans housing. Uh, that's been a huge push from the HCD. We're really grateful for that. Um, and then, you know, just I think sort of the other highlight I'll just mention quickly is that um, we're preparing to release a report later this month that provides a summary of the key initiatives that the ICHH has undertaken over um, the last seven or eight years. Um, the regional networks are certainly um, discussed in, in that report, and we'll be sharing that with you um, shortly. Um, and then I just wanted to, um, going on to the next slide, um, you know, there have been several initiatives recently related to workforce development that um, DHCD has been leading. Um, I've been fortunate to try to assist with secure jobs being um, my personal favorite. Uh, I'm overseeing the, those grants for DHCD now, um, and it's been great to work with their jobs, social housing, um, and the grantees across the state. So in April, we made awards for a million dollars to um, expand that program, as, as the Undersecretary said. Um, since, so I think it was the first year, these numbers are from the first year, 475 families were placed. Um, I just at the end of the day looked at the year two numbers, and it's an additional uh, 79 who've been employed. Um, but so that's just May through August. Um, so, you know, it's really been a, a tremendous opportunity for us to be able to support um, what we know works for, for long-term solutions to homelessness for families, connecting them to training, employment, childcare, um, and other resources. Um, we are in the process of reviewing uh, uh, proposals to award another 500,000. We're hopeful that we'll be able to make award announcements, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then, I don't know if you want to say something about the community action. Well, we, in addition, um, again, with South Shore in partnership, working with community action agencies to do outreach, um, particularly to the home-based families around jobs and job placement. And um, I think it was a good effort and we're able to uh, essentially enroll over 500 families. So in addition to secure jobs, we had uh, that effort going on. And then we have a third effort on jobs and employment and uh, education in our public housing and MRVP program called MassLead that we uh, started funding in May. So we've really got a number of efforts around um, employment, education, uh, financial literacy, asset development, and I know that that's to me, you know, a key part of sustainability and um, making sure families um, are able to be self-sufficient over the longer term. So, um, just, so just to wrap up, I, I would just mention one other thing, and that's public housing. So, major public housing legislation passed. Um, the governor signed the most, I guess the most sweeping reform since the program started in the 1940s. Uh, so, it's significant. It's far-reaching. Uh, the governor signed that in August. And it's a consensus bill, which is great. And we're now implementing all the different components of the legislation. And we have an advisory group and uh, various working groups to help us on each part of that. So you should just be aware that's a, a big effort going on. We're hoping to, well, we need to work on regs and guidelines and get a new program started in public housing. And I'm very, very excited about it. And one piece of that is an online application in single waiting list statewide for all state public housing and <coughs> rental assistance. That's under development. Um, we're very encouraged in terms of the progress being made. Um, this is being done by ITD with the administration. It's a very high priority project. And it's in, it's in development. 
and it's being tested. And so we're expecting to be able to launch a pilot in early 2015. And um, it's going to make a huge difference both for, of course, the local housing agencies and the regional agencies, but also the consumer, people who are applying for assistance. So instead of having to go to every separate local housing authority and fill out a separate application, you'll be able to do that in one place and submit your information and then um, in, in one statewide list. So we're very excited about that. So I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions or take any um, feedback that we should be aware of, things that we should be focusing on. Look on page two, the details of the 2013 survey. When you look at the educational attainment of the 850 plus homeless adults, a number that might surprise people is that 32% of these homeless adults have a higher education degree. Um, and I think that leads, uh, you know, that, that just reinforces the discussions that we're having that dealing with homelessness is really a multifaceted approach. And I would assume, and we don't have the statistics, but I would assume that many of these 30, you know, 32% of homeless adults who have a higher education degree, um, it's either substance abuse, uh, whether drug or alcohol, or unattended to mental health uh, issues. It's only been recently that the community that the, has, has begun to remove the stigma of mental <coughs> health and mental illness. So, but that's, that's a number I think that would surprise, mm -hmm. surprise some people. I would mean staff. There are, there, are, there are people who are dealing with a homeless, homelessness or the issues that could lead to homelessness. And I think that, uh, that is something that I've learned from the group is prevention is something a lot easier to try to work with than actually finding housing at this point in time. So, other, other thoughts or questions? Sal? Yeah, one of my favorite uh, guys, Sherlock Holmes, always says that conspicuous by their absence. Uh, is the workforce development system um, in this room. And uh, I was fortunate enough to work in that system and now I work in community development. And I'd like to ask, at, you know, locally it's, it's, it's difficult to, I think, to uh, break down silos and try to forge relationships, but I'd like to ask, are there anything being done at the state level to look at the, re the combined resources uh, between uh, the Department of uh, Labor and Workforce Devel Development and DHCD. Yeah, they are a member of the Interagency Council, so they have representation on the council. And um, you know, I think some of the challenges that we've had in, in forging sort of more purposeful relationships with them have been around the fact that you know, the vast majority of their resources are federal and um, very specifically targeted. So it's been difficult to um, identify opportunities uh, and how to perhaps use those resources in a slightly different way and how do we gain access to them for the clients that we're talking about. So I think, you know, there's been some progress there and I see a lot of that actually happening at the local level partnerships. Um, through secure jobs, through other, you know, relationships that have formed between providers and um, the career centers where, um, you know, there's this great example that, I mean, I'm sure it's happening here, but the one that always sticks out in my mind is in Brockton and Quincy, um, Father Bills has staff that's co-located in those career centers, and they've formed this real working relationship day to day with the staff there so that it makes the career center more user friendly for this population. The federal mandate is for them to be open and accessible to everyone, and so therefore it's difficult for them to target one population or another or, or um, sort of amend their services to meet the needs of one sort of group or another. Those are the challenges we've faced. We've been looking to these um, local examples to show us how we might build that into <coughs> more of a systemic solution. So it continues to be a, a real challenge. Yeah, I, I just would add uh, that um, in this region, we have two workforce boards. We have the New Bedford Workforce Board, which uh, Peter is the chair of, and we also have the Fall River uh, Workforce Board. I think leadership from those boards needs to be present. That's the first thing. And second... Well, they're both members. They just mm -hmm. don't always attend. Right. Peter, Peter, Peter always Yeah, well, yeah. Peter's yeah. always yeah. there. And, and but both, both WIB um, executives are members mm -hmm. of our... Mm -hmm. But Sal's right. It's not 
just it's the workforce system. It's, mm -hmm. not, right. it's not the WIB. WIB's only one part of the workforce right. system. You mentioned the word career centers, and, and that's really where we need. Yes. You're right. You're right. right. And, and just the, the second thing before, before the discussion goes, it is the, 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 the WIA Act has just changed, right? And it's broadened the ability of workforce boards to use uh, their resources in a multitude of ways. And I think there's a great, great opportunity right at this moment. Um, but but I, I think what I'm trying to highlight here is there needs to be leadership at the state level. There are 16 workforce boards in the system. There's a whole department up there. And there needs to be leadership at the state level to, to begin to set, uh, to set the example and set Go, uh, you know, combine goals and partnership opportunities for folks locally. Uh, the organization works by, by being able to hold these meetings and do various, various things. And there are times when you need to pull everybody together, as Mike said, some various meetings, and Sally mentioned it. Um, there are only six of us left in, this, in the state, from what I understand. Well, I'm not sure there's, there's six active ones. Six, eight, eight active eight, ones. Eight active ones. Um, but the work that gets done is great, great work. But it is it is a, a, a sustainability issue, and, and I just I just I know I know you're aware of it, and, I, and I'm not I'm not jumping into a handout at this point in time. Uh, I say that for all of us, uh, quite frankly. Uh, the Feynman Fund was the original uh, funding source, and it was never intended to be a long-term source. It was it was a pilot program. Um, I think what we have demonstrated is the gross success of the pilot. Um, my assumption is that others have as well. Yes. Um, and if it works, it needs to be continued. And our sustainability, we have a sustainability subcommittee. Uh, we have some discussions. It, and, and this isn't just for the undersecretary. This is for all of us. There is a sustainability problem um, of where the funds will go to be able to come from to, to continue us. I, I mentioned it, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't get grossly better. It's not where we want it to be. Um, we think that we can do even more work uh, and better work uh, with, if we can put together a sustainability program that doesn't um, uh, have Janet wondering whether or not she's going to be working for us in the next six months. I mean, that's just uh, uh, a lot of work. That's, uh, uh, but I, I, I throw that out. I, 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 it's a shameless plug, as I said, because the undersecretary's here and, and Liz is what, what we do. But it's really for all of us as well. We have to, we have to get our hands around that. Um, how, how do we continue this? If we, if we truly do feel it's been successful, and, and, and the point where we are today versus when we started, uh, I do think it's very successful. We have to figure that out, and that's we can't ask others to figure it out. We have to figure it out. We'll be happy to take other partnerships into it, but we have to figure that out, and uh, you'll be hearing more about that as we go along as well. I think it's important to add that the two United Ways in the room provide major, major support. United Way Greater Honorable Taunton provides me with an office, computers, whatever I need, plus part of my money to get to do this work. And Bob Horn from the United Way Greater Fall, uh, Fall River does this. I don't have an office there. I'm sure if I needed space down here, I could certainly go in and use their conference room. We have used their conference room before. But the United Ways have been such a yep. great support to this. So um, I very much agree that we need to provide support to the active networks. We tried twice in the budget. didn't didn't work. Um, and then we have the Housing Preservation and Stabilization Trust Fund, which the legislature um, funded. And I actually went that route, as Liz, as Liz knows. I think she might have even called around to people. And apparently we couldn't make that work because we can't fund administrative, yeah. essentially. Um, it wasn't, we, it wasn't we can't, well. yeah, so I was going that route. I, I want to try and figure out a way to do it. It's got to be a, a pot of funding that's eligible and not directly for services, because that was what I think that was the problem with that. Because I was ready to go, I was, you know, and I was told we can't use the money in that fashion. So maybe we can. I, I'd love to figure out a way to do it, and I don't think it's a lot of money. For I mean, it's I, I think. A, for the whole, when you look at the whole budget, it's a very, very modest amount for each group. And I'm hoping, you know, in the upcoming fiscal year we can figure this out. Right. I'm, I'm but definitely I, committed to doing I, that. I, and I know that, and I, I, it's kind of, it, 
a bit of a shameless plug. It gives you the opportunity yeah, to say well, anybody well, know that, you're, that you are. Yeah, if you, you are, have any ideas on how, how we can do it, um, or if we go for you know another line item possibility and see if that can you know, work. Right, and I throw that out for the, for the rest of us. There, there are, there are, I mean, look, just look up, there are minds far better than mine in, in this room that would that could uh, come up with some suggestions as to where we go, even if it's on a short-term basis, uh, but to where we go. Ali? I'm, I'm, I'm going to shift. I, I'm going to go to the elderly conversation of those that are around, that, uh, and, and how do we do that. Um, we, we operate two shelters in any given time, about 35 to 45% of the population. Or, as you say, 50 years old, and I'm looking around this room laughing to myself, I'm saying, "Y'all probably it's all old." I, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Oh my God!" That's <laughs> because she's not there yet. Yeah. No, I, that's what I'm laughing about. I mean, she said, "I'm 50." I'm saying, "Well, look at this room. She's probably it's all old." So I thought that was really fun. But anyhow, uh, I didn't come up with the elder affairs. So. <laughs> <laughs> there are those of us that would. Yeah. I mean, why we're quote old? I wonder about the title, but nonetheless, um, I. Given that that's what we see, and I'm not going to do 50 as the age, I'm going to tell you it's like 60. Yeah. Uh, that where we do our cutoff when we're looking at that age, that we're talking this 35 to 45 percent of the population during some periods of time are at that age and older, and and many of them are medically compromised, which has been which has been really um, a serious serious problem I think for many shelters, yeah. and uh, and certainly is a serious problem to the community. But the interrelationship of the community is really very hard. And, and I'm not sure exactly what that's all about, but I'm going to run off of Sal's theory that maybe this group will help this conversation that you're doing at the state level. But on the bottom level, because of the funding of many of the older programs and where they receive their money in their pockets, being able to use them can be somewhat restrictive. Yeah. So while you've got this elder individual who is in desperate need of many things, some of that money is sitting over here, and you can't get at it for a variety of barriers, many of which I don't understand because I don't understand the older system that well, although we're, we're, so I'm going to learn it pretty quickly. Um, and I wonder if you're going to look at that, number one, to how to open those doors, because from my perspective, if someone comes wandering into the door, and they're an elder and they're vets, we know what to do if they're an elder and vet. That's not a problem. We call the vets. We get to support people in, and we've now added... Um, what do you call it, AmeriCorps person only going to be doing that for us in, out of um, our office because of the numbers that we manage. But um, if, they're, if they're older and they're non-vets and they're homeless, and while they fit one piece of criteria, they really should be able to access that other piece. And trying to get at that piece is almost impossible. And, and I hope that somebody thinks about how we open those doors to be able to do that because obviously it's spreading the pot in many ways where I think it, it should be spread and um, and how do we create that kind of access yeah you know those are definitely the conversations we've been having at this steering committee group and you know I am certainly no expert on the elder system elder affairs has been great great partners and really leaders of this group and um, have been teaching us a lot about that side of the of the system, and likewise, we've been trying to teach them about the other side, the housing and, and homelessness side of the system, and and so it has been a lengthy process of just trying to understand what the landscape looks like and where the opportunities might sit. Because I think we we definitely identified the problem you're talking about, where there are there are resources out there, but they're not necessarily accessible to the people that we're trying to serve for whatever reason. And so um, you know, Elder Affairs has been looking at their programs and how you know are there adjustments to regulation or or administrative adjustments that they can make that can ease some of those barriers. Um, you know, it's still early days for us in, in figuring that out, but the commitment is certainly there from Elder Affairs, and, and I think we have a really good group, of a cross-sector group that's trying to sort this out. So it would be great. I'd love to follow up with you and hear a little bit more about what your experience has been, because I think that could be helpful for us as we, we you know, we're sort of in the phase now of, of trying to pin down some concrete action stuff. So, so that might be helpful for us to, to talk more with Well, I, I think I'm really good. Patrick, I think we're way, we're way ahead of you because this conversation mm -hmm. around seniors and, and uh, emergency shelter, six years ago, yeah. eight years ago, we had a, a committee that we actually 
We're trying to make this thing go. And we ran into so many barriers in terms of, well, what do you mean you can't do that? No, 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 we can't do that this way. We finally gave up. I mean, but we were at the local level, more at it, and then we created the subcommittee off of the, the SOCO group uh, to try and keep having that conversation. But you know what? This is eight years later. I'm tired of the conversation. I mean, somebody should be able to figure this out. It shouldn't be that hard, I don't think. But, um, and maybe, you know, maybe having, you know, some of the folks that are on the side of the shelters involved in that conversation would be helpful because they can identify exactly, I think, where they were trying to go and why they couldn't get there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and to try and open up some of those questions. They really do have some, you know, they really do have some pretty good program, programs that should be available to folks. And they fall right through the holes. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, stealing we've, we've kids' seen, money, you know, seen, kids uh, stealing their money, their social security checks. <laughs> Literally, and then they throw the, old, throw the old guy out in the street. Yeah. Really? We've seen a lot of difficulty, specifically around the 50 to 62 group. Um, you know, a lot of times they present, you know, especially if they've been chronically homeless, present medically as much older than they are, and, but they don't qualify for some of the elder services yet. They're not old enough. So, um, you know, we're trying to figure that out, but I appreciate your thoughts and definitely call Okay, you. we're going to slide along because I'm going to do my best to. Get, get us done in time. So, um, already having.